Uh, next, while he's getting set up, is uh, Gerson Silva uh, from the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and he's going to talk about targeting prion-like aggregation of mutant P53 against cancer. First of all, I'd like to, to thank Sunrat and uh, all the organizers for the fantastic uh, meeting. So I have been have enjoyed a lot. So uh, my talk, I will try to convince you that uh, P53 it also makes uh, amyloids, and and that is very important for in, in cancer. But before, because P53 is not completely in a, uh, intrinsically disordered, I will present some very quick results on alpha synuclein. So. The way we, we have for many years in the last 20, almost 30 years, studied uh, protein folding, protein misfolding, and, and an aggregation, we have used a, a, a very exquisite technique that is high pressure. And uh, with pressure, we can pretty much not only investigate the folding and uh, assembly and, of course, unfolding dissociation, but this can also, because when you make uh, oligomers and amyloids, the, the force that make those interactions are very similar to the ones involved in, in folding and for association of proteins. So pressure works very well, especially because uh, uh, it does affect mostly, as shown here, it, it changes the equilibrium towards the smaller volumes. Of course, that's uh, the more dynamical principle. But also, uh, we know that when proteins are formed, uh, either in oligomers or folded state or even in, uh, in fibros, uh, you, you cannot satisfy all the van der Waals uh, minima, and you have uh, cavities. And of course, when these cavities appear, you have the, the, the dissociation or unfolding. And also water, one that are, we, we and other people have shown that water, when makes, we replace protein-protein interaction with water-protein interaction, there is also a decrease in volume. So the, the, the combination of the two make pressure quite a uh, good way of uh, reversibly, in most cases, study the uh, unfolding and dissociation. And in the last years, we have pretty much used high pressure to study uh, disassembly of, of proteins. So in our lab, we have uh, used pressure also to study the virus. Uh, now with the, the Zika uh, 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 epidemic uh, outbreak uh, that started two, week, two weeks ago, we got some grants and, and we were able to produce inactivated particles well, because pressure only changed a little bit the, the context. And when we, we go, come back to atmospheric pressure, you still have the particle that is very immunological. But we have also tried to understand how pressure works, we and other people. And clearly, uh, I won't go through the, this data, what pressure does is to push water uh, pretty much like uh, well, we're using combination of thymol and urea. So here we use the combination of pressure and urea. And different than urea, that when the nature that you have a preferential bind of urea, so uh, pressure would uh, make water preferential binding, and that could be detected by NMR and uh, by SACS and by different techniques. So this would be quite relevant for some of the, for the final part of my talk that I'll, I'll try to address the question, what, what are the in intermediates or excited states of P53 that are involved in information of the, uh, uh, involving to aggregates. So uh, we, we have seen very often that the fibros, especially either of alpha synuclein that's intrinsically unfolded or transtyretine, we can dissociate them by pressure, completely dissociate them by pressure. And when we take out the pressure, we have a, a reassociation. So showing that it's quite reversible. In the case of alpha synuclein, I just brought this slide, it's, it's quite uh, useful because we can dissociate the, uh, the fibros at relative, very low pressure. So here's the animal of the fiber. Of course, you cannot, uh, HSQC, you cannot see anything because you have a big fiber. As we start to put relatively little pressures, small pressure, 500 bar, 1,500 bar, we, we start to have the 
dissociation, uh, still there are intermediate pressure, you have uh, uh, fibers that are a little bit remodeled, and at, at relatively low pressures, we can completely dissociate, and as we, we, we had the NMI information of the sequence and we look at the dynamics, clearly what we, uh, the mechanism that is uh, making the, the fibers to dissociate by pressure is pushing water, especially towards the, the hydrophobic core. And, uh, and uh, one way to, to show that very clearly is that, for example, as we replace water with the glycerol, it, it makes much, uh, you need a much higher pressure to, to dissociate the fibers. So uh, now I'll change gears to, to talk about the, the P53. Uh, we're, we're lucky that uh, 15 years ago we are working with the premium protein and the P53, and we start to find that, that they could behave very similar, uh, including binding nucleic acid. The uh, premium protein does bind RNA and, and DNA, and to some extent, uh, aggregation is modulated by, uh, by bind of uh, uh, this, uh, this nucleic acid. And also, LIPS, more recent, has been shown. But in P53, this is a tumor suppressor, so the story I'm going to to, to tell today is about how we show that it can aggregate and form amyloids, and that seems to be quite uh, important in terms of the, especially in, in cancer. So, uh, P53, uh, I won't go through very in detail about P53, but it is very important to control as, as a tumor suppressor, very important to control the cell cycle. Uh, if it's, for some reason, it's not working. For example, if you have a somatic mutation that is present in, in, fifth, in half of the old human cancer, so it's quite uh, prevalent. And uh, now, because if you have this mutation, one has thought, well, maybe one can stabilize the, the, the mutant and get back uh, the, uh, the function of P53. Uh, the other problem uh, that people notice uh, uh, very early is that in fact, these mutations are somatic mutations. So, uh, in principle, if you have a mutation, one allele, maybe the other allele will, will do okay. But one thing that was observed is that there is a dominant negative effect. So, uh, to some extent, the, the, the mutant inactivates the, the, the Y type. So, the uh, P3, as uh, I mentioned quickly, is made uh, is a modular protein, has a DNA that binds domain. Most of the somatic mutations, 95%, occurs in this DNA binding domain. Has a segment that is, uh, is intrinsically disordered in any term domain. It has a determinization domain and a small C terminal domain over here. So, as I mentioned before, we're working with all these proteins, and Daniele Shimaro in the lab, she was, uh, uh, she was doing this experiment. The first surprise, when, and then we use only the DNA binding domain, and it has a single tryptophan. So that's make it very convenient to follow uh, the, the unfolding by, uh, uh, by looking at the, the change in the spectrum of the, the tryptophan. So as the tryptophan gets exposed, so you have a, a shift to, to the red, and you have changes in t intensity. So the first surprise was that when uh, P53 was the nature, was uh, at 37 degrees, uh, uh, very low pressure were needed. That w was one of the surprise. And the second uh, surprise is that uh, uh, different than the other, all the other proteins we were studying, uh, as the protein starts to denature, we start to have uh, uh, aggregation as measured here by light scattering. As you change the temperature, you need uh, higher pressures and you have le less aggregation. So uh, this was published in 2003 in two papers, different uh, studies that we, we did by change temperature and, pre and, uh, and going including to coded the denaturation. But what Daniel Shimaro did in this uh, biochemist paper was to look at the aggregates. And the next surprise was that they were very similar to amyloid aggregates. First, there were quite a lot of uh, these uh, structures that are quite present in uh, alpha-synucleins. Uh, and also, uh, 
waiting uh, a little bit longer, start to see a lot of, uh, of fibrils that can be seen by uh, AFM, atomic force microscopy, and electron microscopy. So we propose at that time that maybe uh, that could be a mechanism. People used, used to believe because when you have the full length P3, it makes a tetramer. So people would believe that the mechanism of neck, neck uh, 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 dominance effect would be by tetrameriz uh, tetramerization of white type with the mutant, but that turned out not to be the case. And maybe aggregation could be a way that when you start to have aggregation of, of, uh, of the mutant, you do. Uh, divert the, the white type into the aggregates, and then you would have this kind of a prion-like effect, and would, would explain the, the, the negative dominance effect. So, uh, well, we decided to look at uh, not only uh, not using pressure, but observing the ag aggregation at uh, 37 degrees. And usually P3 in the cellar context has a lifetime of about three, four minutes. So. Uh, in principle, aggregation will not be a problem because very quickly it exerts its function and then it's degraded. But if you wait long enough in vitro, you, we start to see uh, by measuring typhlavin T binding uh, aggregation. And, but when we, we use uh, what are call, uh, called hotspot mutants, we had not only much more aggregation, but also uh, faster aggregation, indicating that the mutant was indeed more uh, uh, aggregation prone. And these were could uh, stain with Congo red. We, by uh, aggregation was very uh, uh, heterogeneous. When you separate the fibers, they, they give you this fingerprint of a, a cross beta, a cross beta, beta sheet. And, um, and so we start thinking that maybe uh, hot, uh, the, the P3 hotspot somat mutation that correlate with aggregation could ex explain uh, not only the, the loss of function, but also the do dominant negative effect and eventually the, the gain of function because eventually this could, be, could lead to the interaction with, uh, with not only with the white type, uh, uh, co-aggregation with the white type, but also aggregation with other, uh, other transcription factors, as I'll talk a little bit later. And when you look at the, the sequence of the DNA by domain, indeed, there are a lot of sequences that, that have, uh, that, uh, uh, have uh, the, 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 this tendency to, to aggregate, especially in this region, to, to 50 to, to 60. And, uh, uh, and then we decide, well, uh, if it's true that uh, the protein, uh, we decide to test whether that it would be possible to have a co-aggregation of the mutant form with the white type. So the experiment that we did, so here is just the aggregation of the white type, but we, 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 we make some aggregates of the mutant, and we take two or three percent and add it to the white type, and clearly, we had uh, an increase in the speed of the aggregation of the white type. Because here is the control that you don't have, uh, you have only, only the, the seed and you don't have any, we don't have any change in signal. And here you have the, the, uh, the seed simulating the aggregation of uh, the white type. So, uh, so the problem then, we can conclude that the problem with the mutation will not be so much because of your, the, the lack of function, but to be this tendency that the mutant would drive the white type into an aggregate form, and you have a cell that you don't have any uh, fun, uh, 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 function P53. So we decide, well, that is in vitro. How about in cells? How about in, in, uh, in uh, uh, in, in human material. So in order to look into the cells in, in cell culture and also in, 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 in different biopsies, we, we test whether the, the aggregates of P53 could bind uh, a, A11 antibody, that is a, a non-specific antibody against uh, amyloids, uh, small amyloid oli oligomers. We also test with, with, with uh, antibodies against fibrils and I will not show here. And clearly, when we have this soluble protein, we didn't have any, any, any binding. And when we had the, the aggregated protein, either white type 
or mutant, we had a lot of, uh, of binding, and that's the contour with, with transtyretine. So we went to, to, to uh, biopsy of breast cancer, and here is uh, by, uh, uh, a tumor that uh, we have uh, white type P3, that's, P3 uh, that's the labeling of P3, that's the uh, anti-oligoma, and that's the co-localization. So we have very few co-localization co when we have only uh, when you have the white type. Uh, in contrast, when you have the mutant, we have a lot of aggregation and, uh, and that correlate quite well with those results that we observed in vitro, that indeed uh, these proteins are aggregated inside the tumors and, uh, and uh, in collaboration with Claudia Gallo, we, we screened uh, about 90 biopsies, and there was a clear, depending on the mutation, and the more uh, aggressive was the mutation for, for the patient, we had the, the, the clinical history of the, of the patients, the more aggregation we had. So we start to think that maybe uh, aggregation of P3 would be much more important, even that we were thinking before, because it would involve uh, it would explain, especially in the last years, a lot of uh, attention has been uh, uh, now turned into, into the gain of functions of uh, the tumors, because, uh, especially of the, of the uh, tumors with, with mutations. And, and eventually, not only P3 could aggregate inside the cells in a, in a prion-like fashion, and eventually could be a uh, uh, transfer cell to cell, that's still a hypothesis. I think uh, uh, Professor Maggi will, will present some data corroborating this possibility that uh, uh, aggregate P53 can be transmitted from cell to cell in a similar way to proteins like in, in, in neurodegenerative disease. One has to pay attention to here that uh, P53 cancer is a is a, it's not a degenerative disease. You have a disease that you have uh, is the opposite. But in this case, because you, you, you shut down a protein that's very important to control the cell cycle, you, you have this consequence and you have the, the cancer. And so that's a, a, another uh, a model that we, we, we have used that is human glioblastoma. And then white type uh, uh, and has this mutation. And when we, we in vitro, we do the aggregation of white type. We have very few, uh, ag uh, very uh, at the, uh, small aggregation. And we, when you have the mutation, one can see how fast is the aggregation of, of these mutants. So in, in few seconds, so that's pretty much showing that probably that what's happening. In, and when you look to the, the cell lines that have, uh, that have this mutation, we have a lot of aggregates and that correlate with that. And not only that, we see, and that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, is that uh, not only that we have a higher propensity to aggregate, and when you look, we, try, we use high pressure, we have a much lower stability. So that goes along what have been found with other proteins like transtyretine, that the, the mutants that uh, you have lower stability, you have a higher propensity to, 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 to aggregate. So uh, in the last years, several people work on this. Well, when we, uh, I have a story that when I, when I tried to publish that paper in 2003, uh, was my, my, only, my only paper that was sent back to me without going to reviews in JVC, or is even the editorial board of <laughs> JVC. And because it's said, well, that's probably not uh, very important. And so I usually, I usually talk this to people. Usually that those papers that are more difficult to publish are the ones that are, are more important. And in the last years, a lot, a lot of different uh, uh, papers by a group of Alan First, but also by uh, uh, this group in Belgium that has shown that uh, P3 can co-aggregate with P63 and P73, and uh, this work will be shown uh, is, is the, the talk in this, in this section. Uh, so then, uh, now what I want to address is that maybe we can use this uh, this property of a prion-like aggregation P3 as a therapeutic target. Maybe if you can prevent aggregation of a mutant P3, we could find a way to 
to treat cancer, although cancer is a very complex disease, but since it, mutant P3 is present in 50%, and, and if you take into consideration, I'm taking this from a, a recent review, uh, P3 mutant cancer, cancer containing a P3 mute, will lead to the deaths of more than 500, more than half a billion people uh, alive today, unless we, we have a way to, 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 uh, uh, to treat the, uh, the people. And uh, uh, so the idea is that one can block the formation of these oligomers, especially because in the cells we thought uh, we, we could find a lot of uh, oligomers and one can uh, eventually, uh, uh, maybe in combination with other drugs, could treat cancer. So our first uh, suggest was to use nucleic acid. I mean, we, we, we have, we're playing with a lot of nucleic acid, so we, we use some sequence, uh, cognate sequence. So one can see that when you use a, a cognate sequence here, uh, P3 uh, uh, gets quite stable. And indeed, when we, we use this sequence in, uh, uh, in the aggregates, we could uh, prevent aggregation uh, and have a very stable uh, protein. Of course, we're not, we not going to treat people with uh, uh, nucleic acid. We try to, to think in a way of using modified, uh, modified nucleic acid. They were very efficient in, in inhibiting aggregation, but unfortunately, so that's uh, phosphor 208 uh, modified uh, nucleic acid. But unfortunately, these are quite toxic, so we more or less gave up of that. And also, because in, in parallel, we're studying the interaction of P3 with RNA, and has pretty much like in, in other cases, that uh, RNA, in some case, at high concentration, as a study done in collaboration with Suparna uh, in some case, at the low concentration of RNA, we have a simulation of aggregation. At high concentration of uh, RNA, we have uh, inhibition of aggregation, but we do form small oligomers that can seed the aggregation of, uh, of a P3. So it has pretty much this dual effect and like this Dr. Uh, Jack and Mr. Hyde effect. And that correlates a lot to many of the things we have seen in the, especially in, in, the, in the, this liquid liquid phase transition that eventually some things go wrong and you have uh, pathology. So we decide to go to, to small molecules. Uh, I'll talk very quickly about uh, some uh, resveratrol. So we're trying resveratrol derivatives and also some microacceptors. First about resveratrol, well, it would be good if it, resveratrol could be very efficient against cancer because it's present in wine, like we had a cup of wine, a cup, a gla a cup of glass of wine uh, uh, last, last, uh, uh, last night. And indeed, the resveratrol, that was a paper by uh, Daniele uh, da Costa, and in, uh, in cells that uh, uh, we have white type 3 resveratrol is very efficient in killing the cells. If you block the P53 path, we, we, you, we, you, you stop the killing. And then what we decided to do more recently it was to, to see if, how resveratrol was acting. And in fact, resveratrol does inhibit aggregation of uh, in vitro of, uh, of uh, P3 uh, and is much more efficient by inhibiting aggregation of uh, uh, mutant P53 and uh, other uh, similar compounds were not so efficient. So, and what Daniel did was to test uh, now in, in, two, in different tumor cell lines, I'll show only uh, a couple. Uh, one can see that uh, uh, if you don't have resveratrol, you have a lot of aggregates here. So we have the oligomers. As you increase resveratrol concentration, we have, uh, we decrease a lot the oligomers. That's in, in tumor cell lines, and that was done in a, in, in a, in a animal model, xenograft implanted uh, tumors, and so that shows that the resveratrol is also able to to stop cell proliferation and also to inhibit cell cell migration. So this way, resveratrol was pretty much uh, acting by inhibiting aggregation, and that's the good point. The the bad thing is that the concentration of resveratrol, in order to have a, that high concentration, would need to take 10 liters of wine. So that's, of course, not very healthy. 
Uh, the other compound that we are testing is Prima-1. Uh, Prima-1 has been in, in, uh, in clinical phase, one and two, in going to three, but uh, it's known to, 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 to be a very good drug, uh, good drug against uh, tumors in, in reactivating P3. What we measured was if Prima-1 was inhibiting aggregation, and indeed it, it does inhibit aggregation, similar to resveratrol, we have a decrease in the oligomas, and again, uh, Prima-1 can also be used to, uh, apparently, these, these compounds that uh, micro-accept compounds that you have, you make an anaduct with the sulfidryls, you can, they can be used to, uh, uh, they can be tested. One can clearly see here in this uh, pull-down uh, experiment that you use A11. So you, if you use P3, you have, uh, uh, without treatment, treatment, we have equal amount of P3. We, when we, we, we do with uh, the, the immune precipitation with A11, when we treat, we don't have any aggregates. So that's pretty much proves that uh, we can stop aggregation of that. So stop this. We are using other compounds, different micro-accept compounds. So that's uh, the work of Julia Ferrete. And we have uh, been, uh, she had some success with some, uh, some compounds. So the main conclusion is that uh, the, the inhibition of this uh, oligomeric species uh, 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 and, uh, and inhibition of aggregation by, uh, can be done by using the, that small molecules. But of course, we needed to understand a little bit more about uh, what are the species that we needed to target against uh, uh, aggregation. So in the last one minute, I think, uh, I'll talk about this, the, the, the evidence that uh, a lot of the aggregation of P3 you have uh, in the gaon function would depend a lot on, on co-aggregation with uh, uh, other tumor suppressors like P63 and P73 and eventually even uh, other proteins. This is a nice paper recently published by the group of uh, 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 by this group that, uh, that shows that uh, apparently the formation of the aggregates with, PC, uh, with P63 and P73 depends on the full length proteins and you have uh, the, the, the aggregation. And in what we have done in, in the, in the um, in, uh, more recently is, is to explore, uh, to try to understand, for example, why uh, P63 and P73 uh, have a much lower propensity to aggregate and I don't have time to go through all that, but just show here, shown here clearly that you have a P53 and P63 and P73 aggregate in much less, and that's correlate again with uh, uh, P3 being much more susceptible to pressure, and P63 and P73 not susceptible to pressure. And Elio Sino, uh, postdoc in the lab, he showed by molecular dynamics that probably that correlate with uh, uh, with uh, 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 the exposure of a backbone, hydrogen bond, that it, uh, one has much more BHB exposed to water than P63 and P73. Uh, in the lab, we are trying now to, to, to get intermediates of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, P53 uh, unfolding, try to clarify uh, and go into the conclusion. Uh, apparently, we can get this species that is an expanded nature like globular, and that's the one uh, that would be prone to aggregate, and maybe that's probably the one that we want, uh, would be like a, a, a transient IDP uh, that probably needs, uh, we can tag this for, for uh, and use to in, in, in therapeutic strategies. And uh, with that, I want to finish saying that we are very uh, confident that uh, uh, we can use uh, all this information. We need to understand a little bit more, try to understand what are the species that inside the cell uh, 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 eventually gives the, this gain of function effects, interact with different proteins. And with that, I want to finish. That's still, there are several open uh, questions that needed to be understood, including 
the possibility that P3 uh, that's quite concentrated in the nucleolus event is na, na, in, for participate in these uh, phase transitions. So I want to acknowledge all the people in, in the lab, different people that I mentioned along the work, and that's the, the, the group. Thank you. Are there questions for Gerson? The wild type tetrama, or does, uh, does it enhance aggregation by forming mixed tetramas, where you've got a mutant plus wild type uh, yeah. uh, present? No, that, that's a very good question. Yeah, uh, well, in fact, it was a w uh, work by Alan Furst that shows that uh, tetramas itself, they do not exchange. I mean, it's very difficult to exchange, uh, and they did both white type with mutant and also white, ty uh, white type with P63 and P73. So uh, what I believe is that uh, aggregation would go, go pretty much in the direction of a formation of transient uh, dissociated species that uh, if they... Uh, if you wait long enough, or especially when you have a, a mutation that they, they tend to accumulate, in, in the, especially in the nucleus, and then start a necessary pass through the tetramer. And remember, although we have done all the, the cellular work was with the full length, we have repeated everything with the full length, uh, but we, just the DNA bind domain, it, it does not make tetramer, it's a monomeric, and, and, uh, it, and, and it has the same high propensity to aggregate and to co-aggregate, and, uh, well, that has been shown by our lab, but also by Alan Foss, by different labs. But, yeah, that's uh, whether, so my question, I well, remember that uh, P3 is quite tetrameric in the context of DNA binding, so I'm not sure that we're trying, we're using a, a super resolution across to try to, to tackle this and see the state of association inside the cell for white type and, uh, and, uh, and mutants. But, uh, so, but it's just a, a hypothesis that eventually this is like in a soup, interact with RNA, interacting with the, the targets of DNA, and then eventually is not a, quite a fixed tetramer. Over here on the left side. Uh, Professor Silva, I have a very um, basic question, and first of all, I comment for wonderful information on P53. So my question is, I saw uh, means P53 wild type is also forming amyloid aggregates. What type? Wild yeah. type, yeah. And uh, uh, I could see the Congo red staining. So uh, wild type 1 does not give very good uh, birefringence, Congo red birefringence, what we see in wild type. Hmm. And what I couldn't see is the EM images of wild type aggregates as well as the uh, mutant one. So do you have any comment, what would be the morphological differences uh, between wild type fibrils and the mutant fibrils? Mm -hmm. And secondarily, uh, could you see whether it is the fibril uh, that this, or you could see in the cancer patient or the oligomers? Thank okay. You. Yeah, well, first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, we started with fibrils because we're using high pressure. So that was a good way to get a lot of fibrils. Uh, under our conditions, and we see a little bit of fibrils, but for example, in the lab of Supana, using our material, she sh sees very few fibrils. And indeed, she only sees m more fibro when you, when, uh, uh, in the presence of RNA. So uh, I would say that it's, uh, and if you compare with, uh, with, the, with the prion protein, prion protein is also uh, is similar. Uh, you, you in, in order to get the fibers of the prion protein, you needed to have very special conditions uh, that people have worked. Uh, so, and then uh, concern the, the bioreferences, uh, you, you don't get a lot, uh, but you, in this tissue, you get uh, relatively little. So uh, uh, I think it's more, apparently the, in, in, in the cells, uh, would, uh, my guess would be that we have much more small aggregates uh, playing in probably reversible aggregates that needs to be uh, test, experimental test. And that's why you don't see bioreferences. Uh, though you can see a little bit, depending on cell, in, uh, in tumor cell lines, when you start to have a lot of uh, aggregates, and then you see a little bit uh, in, in, in the case of some mutants. So it's quite um, mutant-specific, the kind of aggregates that you have. But yeah, very good question. 
So I know there's a couple more questions, but let's uh, move on and maybe ask those during the coffee break. And let's thank Jerson one more time.